aircraft carrier, kingpin of the Pacific Naval War, a war in which aircraft, whether land-based or carrier-borne, have dominated the scene. In the European war, there have been a number of occasions when capital ship has been sunk by capital ship, the Scharnhorst by the Duke of York's guns, Bismarck by the Rodney and King George V. But in the Pacific, it's been mainly aerial warfare because of the enormous distances involved. In the first three years fighting, aircraft have inflicted all the major casualties. Think of Pearl Harbor, where 150 Japanese planes smashed up eight battleships and a number of other vessels belonging to a power with whom Japan was officially at peace. Think of the Prince of Wales and the Repulse, sent to the bottom by aerial torpedoes and bombs. On the other side of the picture, think of the Battle of the Coral Sea, in which the Japanese lost a carrier, four cruisers, and two destroyers. The Battle of Midway, when they lost four carriers, two cruisers, and had three battleships and four cruisers damaged. Think of the Battle of the Bismarck Sea, in which a whole convoy of 12 transports, three cruisers, and seven destroyers was smashed. In all these actions, no capital ship has ever been in action against another capital ship. So that's the character of the Pacific War. This film will show you the picture from both sides, the fellow being bombed and the fellow doing the bombing. Here are New Zealanders setting out on a bombing trip. Here also is part of an American task force in the Southwest Pacific. Somewhere beyond the horizon is a Japanese naval force. Right overhead, Japanese aircraft are attacking the United States warships, paying special attention to aircraft carriers whose own fighters are defending the fleet. Plane v plane and plane v carrier. When things begin to happen, they happen fast. Most of us who have been bombed have felt that we were personally selected as the objective. Aboard ship, you know you've been specially selected. You are the target. And it's the cameraman's unenviable job to keep turning while everyone else goes flat and bombs come screaming down. planes being shot down into the drink, carriers taking evasive action, carriers being hit, hits and near misses, plane v plane and plane v carrier, bombs and flak, it's all here in one historic screen record of sea warfare. And if we get away with it, thinks the cameraman, our luck's in. Aircraft carrier X, this ship was called. Actually, it was the Enterprise. Carriers are the chief targets, no doubt of that. A near miss and another over there. And now for a close up of a direct hit. Then to fight the flames, men jump to it. Then they turn back for a moment as a new attack develops. Another direct hit. That was on the after elevator of the flight deck. Made a pretty good mess. The ship battles on, passing the wreckage of Jap aircraft burning on the sea. And the firefighters carry on with their job, the fight to save their ship, a fight they eventually won. There's not a moment's let up in this battle against the enemy bombers. Although many are destroyed, the blitz continues. Another carrier, same battle. 
Notice how a big ship can swing when she's in a hurry. Another near miss. Just watch what the concussion does to that plane. You might think from these pictures that the battle was going against the Americans. But those battered aircraft are back from battering the enemy fleet. Actually, during this battle of Santa Cruz, American aircraft succeeded in damaging two Japanese aircraft carriers, one of them probably sunk, two battleships, one again probably sunk, and three cruisers. And in order to show you how it feels to be on the hitting end of the operation, we'll take a look at the Battle of the Bismarck Sea. Early in March 1943, the approach of a large Japanese invasion force was reported. Over a score of troop transports and their escorts had been spotted by reconnaissance aircraft, New Zealand, Australian, American, which observed and photographed the concentration of enemy ships at Rabaul in New Britain. Ever since the Japs had been beaten back in New Guinea, the Allies had been expecting enemy reinforcements in strength, and now they were on the way. The chance to strike a great blow from the air had come. The Royal Australian and Royal New Zealand Air Force and their American comrades had all been longing for just such a chance, and how they took it. New Zealand and Aussie ground staffs as keen as the men who would fly the planes in action. Hours, days, weeks of toil in sweltering heat were about to be gloriously rewarded. It didn't matter which of the three Allied air forces you belonged to, you were an anti-Jap flying man and that was all that counted. Kitty Hawks, Mitchells, Bowfighters and Bostons took off and the cameraman took off with them to make a film record of the show. A score of ships takes a deal of sinking. Not only the fate of New Guinea, but the security of Australia and New Zealand might well depend on the heaviness of the blow about to be struck. Heavy bombers, medium bombers and fighters all went up in a mighty concentration against the big Japanese concentration. There's a Liberator on her way out to the target, and what a target. Every member of every crew knew what was expected of him. The Japs have had it coming to them, they thought, and now they're going to get it. Neither Akak nor Zeros were destined to save the Japs from annihilation in the Battle of the Bismarck Archipelago. From scores of planes marked with the British Rondel or the American Star, the bombs went down into transports packed with Japanese troops. after ship was hit. This historic battle lasted two days. Ships were sunk outright and ships were set on fire. Fighters and bombers that had used up their bombs ripped into the battle again, raking anything that had so far escaped with cannon fire, giving them something to be going on with until bombs could sink them or set them ablaze. Relentlessly, scientifically, the extermination of the Japanese continued. Surviving ships attempted to carry on. Their task was to steam through the straits between New Britain and New Guinea and to reach Finchhafen, Ley, or Salamara on the north coast. Although they were being attacked all the way, right up to the last, the depleted convoys still hoped to succeed in landing reinforcements. A few got within a comparatively short distance of Finchhafen, where the enemy tried to reach port in small boats and landing barges crammed with troops, all fully armed and intent on reaching New Guinea to carry on the fight. They too were wiped out by the guns of the aircraft and when a small target like that is missed, well, we can always have another go. No surrender was offered, no quarter was given. 22 ships and 15,000 troops were destroyed. It was a major disaster for Japan. Yes, in the Pacific War, it's the combination of sea and air power which counts in the struggle for mastery. This struggle, the United Nations can bring enormous supremacy both in ships and aircraft. Properly applied, that supremacy will confound the strategy of Japan and sweep away an empire won by treachery.
Sydney, Australia, and the battleship King George V. Having played her great part in the defeat of Germany, she and many other units of the Royal Navy are now 12,000 miles or more away fighting our other enemy. For the war goes on and the Navy is bringing its great strength to bear upon Japan, with fighting ships like the famous aircraft carrier Illustrious and with fighting leaders like Admiral Rawlings, Task Force Commander, and Rear Admiral Vire. In New Zealand waters, the Dominion's new cruiser, Gambia, was among the ships actively engaging in the Pacific War early this year. Since this film was made, many actions have been reported, ranging from the Straits of Malacca to the Ryukyu Islands. Naturally, no story of British naval action in the Far East would be complete without special reference to the fleet air arm. From our carriers, Corsairs and Avengers have been doing great work. Here's a close-up of an arrestor hook, which you can see in operation as planes land on. Landing on is a tricky business in any weather, that's pretty obvious. When a pilot's been wounded or his aircraft damaged, it's more than tricky. The landing's successful, but it was made with the additional danger of fire. And although the pilot's clear of the danger, an aircraft blazing on the flight deck of a carrier is, well, quite a blitz on its own. Eventually, the plane is dumped overboard, being damaged beyond hope of local repair. On this occasion, a number of pilots were still less fortunate. They were picked up at sea by a destroyer and presently transferred to a carrier, apparently little the worse for their experience. a glimpse of the flagship HMS Howe, 35,000 ton sister ship of the KG-5. When her guns go into action against Jap aircraft, the Jap Navy, or Japanese installations ashore, perhaps the Japanese war makers begin to revise their opinion as to what kind of a people they think we are. Sailing under the command of Admiral Sir James Somerville, CNC Eastern Fleet, it was a strong force that supported the surprise attack on Sabang in Sumatra. Battleships, cruisers, destroyers, and submarines. There were also American, French, and Dutch ships, and American carrier-borne aircraft took part, as well as the fleet air arm. Hellcats, Corsairs, Avengers, and Barracudas did the job. Aircraft are seen on their way to the target, the operation taking place only four days after the transfer of the Southeast Asia Command from New Delhi to Ceylon. The main target was the port of Sabang, on an island off the most northerly point of Sumatra. Commanding the western approach to the Straits of Malacca, Sabang, with its dockyard, power station, wharves, barracks, hangars, workshops and radio station, presented excellent objectives, not to mention shipping in the port. A Jap destroyer, which tried to make a getaway, was hit and set on fire. Another suffered the same fate, also an escort vessel and two merchant ships. Over a score of enemy planes were destroyed on the ground, and direct hits with heavy bombs were obtained on all objectives. These pictures give a pretty good idea of some of the damage done in the attack, in which, to quote Admiral Somerville, caught the Japs with their kimonos up. No one imagine that recent victories in the Pacific indicate a walkover. The Japanese continue to fight back with a fanaticism quite unknown in the West, and they've combined their latest V weapon with the national glorification of suicide in battle. One type of plane is a small rocket-driven machine launched from a larger aircraft and flown by a kamikaze, or suicide pilot. He has no parachute, he's locked in his cockpit, the plane has no landing gear, and it detonates with a huge explosion on contact. From Okinawa come the first pictures of this weapon called the Baka bomb. It carries 2,000 pounds of explosive in its nose. Kamikaze pilots are the elite of the Jap Air Force, 
most of them between 18 and 20 years old. Trained to die by suicide in battle, they are lionized after completing their training course and special prayers are said for them. As their days are numbered and they know it, they are allowed a last glorious fling with the very best geisha girls and their pictures are in all the papers for their national heroes in advance. Wearing ceremonial robes with heads almost completely shaved, they march through the streets receiving the most profound honor from the people everywhere. Then they're ready for their last inevitably fatal flight. It means death for them, but it may spell a triumph for the emperor. So Banzai! And now for the first time, the United States Navy has released films of kamikaze pilots in action. You'll have read a lot about them in the papers. This is it. That one nearly got a destroyer. Here, a Japanese V-pilot has ended his career with a direct hit on a carrier of the Essex class. He's caused casualties and damage on board an enemy ship. And it's for just that purpose that his own life was written off from the first day of his training. In this action, the sky seemed full of suicide planes. Even when they were hit, they still came on. Their losses, of course, are 100%, and a very big proportion are killed without scoring any success. Oh, yes, it's a costly weapon, but the Japanese hold life cheap. And some kamikaze pilots do get their targets. the famous carrier Bunker Hill has been hit. Fires are spreading among the planes on board. The flight deck is like an inferno, but the crew fights for the life of the ship while men who've been blown overboard are being rescued. cruiser has come alongside to help in fighting the fire. At any moment, if the flames reach fuel tanks or ammunition, fresh explosions may add to the crisis. Air attacks, mostly by suicide pilots, sank 33 ships and damaged over 50 in the Okinawa campaign. But when this film was made, not one battleship, fast cruiser or carrier had been sunk by them. Here again, saved like the Franklin by the diversion of her crew, the Bunker Hill survived the attack after fighting fires for eight hours and with the loss of hundreds of men. In addition to the special danger of suicide pilots, the Allies in the Pacific are also encountering all the more orthodox methods of attack. Sixty miles off the coast of Japan, an American carrier force was dive-bombed by Jap land-based aircraft. In this case, no serious damage was done to the task force, but Jap losses were heavy, and as you'll see, some were pretty spectacular. Pictures like these show clearly how the Jap is fighting back. American and British servicemen out there know all about it, of course, but everyone in Britain should know, too. So far, we've only seen the results of enemy attacks, but the many dangers inherent in carrier warfare mustn't be overlooked. Landing on is just one. American plane landing on loses its emergency tank. There goes the tank, it bursts into flames, but the pilot is safe.
That's the emergency tank that caused the trouble. And now another pilot escapes from a very tight corner. With his plane enveloped in flame and smoke, he seems at first to be dead or unconscious. But he too is rescued from what at one moment appeared to be almost certain death. Pictures to remember, just in case anyone tells you that from now on, the Jap war is nothing to worry about. to Japan and to the liquidation of Japanese cruelty and greed is marked with suffering and death. In two months off Okinawa and the Jap homeland, American naval casualties totaled over 4,000 wounded and over 4,000 missing or killed. These are facts to note and pictures to bear in mind. For Japan cannot be smashed except by the skill, the courage and the sacrifice of allied fighting men by land, air and sea. the British task force in the Pacific, thousands of miles from our bases and on our way to replenish from the fleet train which provides all our needs during the brief spells between the business of seeking out the Jap in the striking area. All replenishments must be done at sea and the most important of these is of course oil fuel for the ships and petrol for the aircraft. Here is a heavily laden tanker, the fleet train, closing a carrier. This destroyer will be refueled at the same time. A rocket carries a heaving line across between the two. Longer ropes are then hauled across, and eventually the massive hose pipe through which the vital fuels pass. Meanwhile, breeches boys are rigged. Supplies, the one link with home mails, even spare pilots and other key personnel, all must be hauled across from ship to ship. This looks like a tug of war. It is a tug in the Pacific War. It's an extra heave to keep the jack stay taut as an extra heavy load goes across. This is our first experience of this type of long range sea warfare. In the North Sea and the Mediterranean, we could always return to our bases and dockyards. Here we have to stay at sea but the Royal Navy soon adapted itself to these new conditions. Famous ships are in company. Amongst others, the battleship King George V and the aircraft carriers Indefatigable, Illustrious, Indomitable and Victorious. Great ships, but only forerunners of the might of the Royal Navy which will come out to the Pacific now that Germany has been eliminated. Now the work of the fleet train is done and the task force can get back into the fighting area. They move off once more in search of the Jap. Pilots must keep fighting fit. They keep in trim with fencing and other sports. This time, our naval aircraft will bomb and strafe Jap airfields in the Sakashima Islands and Formosa preventing their use by the enemy against our American allies on Okinawa. Our aircraft are stowed between decks in enormous hangars. Great lifts carry the folded aircraft up to the flight deck. A last minute briefing before the strike. Men of England, Scotland, Wales and Ireland. Men from the Dominions, most of them veterans of air warfare in Europe, and now already experienced in the new conditions of the Pacific. 
Soon, their numbers will grow and grow. This is no one particularly exciting day with Britain's task force in the Pacific. It's just typical of routine daily operations. Here are the deadly Corsair fighters, easily distinguishable by the cut of their wings. Now they're ready for the takeoff. Chocks are removed, the pilot opens up his throttle, and away she roars down the flying deck. Next, an Avenger is off on the job. Notice the straight cut of the wings as compared with the Corsair. jet in the bow helps the navigator to keep the ship dead into wind. While our aircraft are away seeking out the Jap bases, the ships in the task force are naturally a favorite target for Jap suicide bombers. Here comes a kamikaze, a suicide bomber who has made use of cloud cover and slipped through our fighter screen. The pilot's feet are probably padlocked to the rudder bars. It's a robot bomb with a strange ability to twist and turn. Here's another, heading for the illustrious. goes down to naval gunners, so close that his rubber dinghy is blown from the shattered plane onto the flight deck. Meanwhile, in the gathering dusk, our naval aircraft are returning from their strike against the Jap airfields. The carriers turn into wind, and the Avengers, with flaps down, come into land. The arrestor gear pulls them up sharply. The hook is released and the pilot taxis forward at full speed to make room for the next arrival. Specially detailed men guide them to the right spot. There isn't an inch to spare on a crowded flight deck. Meanwhile, Corsairs have been giving fighter protection overhead. Now it's their turn to land. the ship beats this one, which crashes into the island. As the petrol belly tank explodes, fire parties rush into action. The pilot's safe, but the plane has had it. Streams of foam subdue the fire, but the Corsair looks as though it's a write-off. There's no room in carriers for wrecked planes, so this one is a souvenir for Father Neptune. Men on deck search anxiously for missing aircraft. It's a matter of personal anxiety. Two Corsairs out on a special mission have yet to return. The carrier, like a hen anxious for her chicks, cannot settle down until the last of her brood is home. That sounds like them. Yes. Here they come. The batsman has his bats up, lit up because of the growing darkness. Months of training now show their value. The Corsair lands almost in darkness, but it's a perfect landing. The last of the chicks is home to roost. The task force is ready to move off again. Tomorrow, it may be the Ryukyus or perhaps the mainland of Japan. But whatever the job, the Royal Navy will be more than equal to the task. Pictures of part of the British Pacific Fleet 
underline the overwhelming force being brought to bear against Japan before the offer to surrender was made. Supplementing the strength of the American fleet, we had deployed our most powerful units, such as the KG-5 and battleships of her class. Chief emphasis, however, was naturally on the fleet air arm, with its new and powerful carriers and their complements of Seafires, Fireflies, Avengers, Corsairs and the rest. Before the first atomic bomb was dropped, the Japanese Air Force and Navy had been mauled and smashed beyond recognition. Although invasion and terrific land battles lay ahead, Japan was already a defeated nation. A few enemy planes which ventured out to sea during the operation filmed here were destroyed. Allied sea and air power were supreme. On this occasion, an American task force was operating very close to the British ships. Pilots from both fleets were engaged in air strikes against the Japanese mainland. There was also a meeting at sea aboard the American battleship Missouri between Admiral Rawlings and Admiral Halsey. The British Admiral is seen coming across from a destroyer. It was Admiral Halsey's third fleet, which together with Carrier Task Force 38, opened the all-out offensive against the Jap mainland. An offensive preliminary to the invasion of Japan. Hellcats, Corsairs, Helldivers and Avengers began a dawn-to-dusk onslaught on enemy forces afloat and ashore. It's reported that over 70 Jap airfields were so severely shot up that they never got their fighters off the ground to counter Allied blows. Four days after the airstrikes, the Third Fleet was in position to deal Japan an indignity without precedent. Admiral Halsey and his staff check final details. Zero hour and the sounding of general quarters. Action stations, a great moment this. 16-inch guns are brought to bear as the fleet steams off Honshu Island itself at a point only some 300 miles from Tokyo. The Imperial steelworks behind the hills were shelled for two hours. In two days, not one enemy shot was fired. Loss of face, it was loss of her very existence as an empire. The Japanese warlords knew it, whatever they may be saying. Total defeat in the coming months was certain when the atomic bombs, saving far more lives than the lives they took, Compel surrender now. This was one of the pre-surrender scenes off the coast of Japan. A part of the powerful Anglo-American fleet steaming in towards Sagami Bay. The Missouri, Admiral Halsey's mighty flagship, in which the actual surrender was to be signed later. Admiral Halsey himself pays a visit to the British flagship. He comes across by destroyer and British boy to HMS Duke of York, where Admiral Sir Bruce Fraser was waiting to give him the warmest of welcomes. No wonder they were feeling good, for they and the seamen they led had already given the Japs a fearful thrashing before the atom bombs finished them off. And besides, here was the Anglo-American fleet en route for Tokyo and the rescue of our prisoners. Air cover was continuous and complete. No chances were being taken, for Japanese treachery had long been a byword. Well, if they'd wanted to start anything now, they would have been for it. The sky, by the way, was showing signs of the violent typhoons, which presently delayed the plan of action by some hours. And now a Japanese pilot comes aboard Duke of York, bringing charts and full information about minefields and so on. They were taking no chances with him either. They searched him at once. Then, led by the Iowa, the Missouri, and Duke of York, the great fleet, including King George V, cruisers and destroyers steam their victory course to Tokyo Bay itself. This was the moment for the British and American navies. 
Pearl Harbor and Singapore, Prince of Wales and Repulse. If the Japanese didn't know then what kind of a people we are, they certainly knew now. Yes, it was a moment of pride and triumph as the fleet anchored in Tokyo Bay, but yet the uppermost thought in every ship was the rescue of comrades ashore. The first film of one of the first rescues made was taken from a landing craft, one of several which dashed in near Yokohama. Here the waterfront showed little signs of bombing, but behind those buildings, they say, the town had been flattened and work paralyzed. And that's the signal the prisoners had painted on a large mill. As the landing craft came in, the prisoners came running and dancing out onto the jetty. All of them had been captive for some three years, mostly British soldiers from Hong Kong, also a number of sailors, some Americans, and a few Italians. They were nearly all in American uniforms, which had recently been dropped by parachute. They weren't in bad shape, considering everything. These were their quarters, in a ramshackle, tumble-down building, crude and comfortless, all the same a good deal better than some places they'd been in, they said. They were taken off in landing craft to an American hospital ship at once. This was before occupation troops had landed in Japan. As you can see, these prisoners were pretty fit considering, but were they feeling good? It's difficult to imagine just how they must have felt. At last they were free, and soon the many thousands of other prisoners would be free too, though many would have to be nursed back to health. Captivity, starvation, ill treatment, these were over. And almost in the shadow of Fujiyama, the Anglo-American fleet was lying at anchor. Our men were free again. Japan itself was now the prisoner. This was Okinawa on the eve of the signing of Japanese surrender. Hundreds of transport planes were ready to leave with airborne troops who were to begin the occupation by landing on Atsugi. When MacArthur himself landed on the Atsugi airfield, about 18 miles from Tokyo, Japan's fade out as a power and an empire was very near. Yes, it was indeed a satisfactory moment for MacArthur and the men he led when old glory was hoisted here. As the American planes came roaring in, the Japanese went trudging out. For them, the bitterness of total defeat was only just beginning. MacArthur's staff gave sharp orders to Japanese officers and every precaution was being taken against treachery. From Atsugi, the scene changes to the battleship Missouri. This great ship provided the stage for the end of the drama and the final curtain. MacArthur coming aboard is greeted by Admiral Nimitz. The pictures that follow show the highlights of the formal surrender ceremony, the whole of which lasted only about 20 minutes. First, the arrival of the Japanese empowered to sign. The one-legged Shigemitsu, Japan's foreign minister, togged up as he thought appropriately for the occasion, hobbled to the table. General Umeju was to sign on behalf of the general staff. General Douglas MacArthur, showing little signs of what he must have been feeling, opened the proceedings. We are gathered here, representatives of the major warring powers, to conclude a solemn agreement whereby peace may be restored. It is my earnest hope, and indeed the hope of all mankind, that from this solemn occasion, a better world shall emerge out of the blood and carnage of the past, a world founded upon faith and understanding, 
a world dedicated to the dignity of man and the fulfillment of his most cherished wish for freedom, tolerance, and justice. I now invite the representatives of the Emperor of Japan and the Japanese government and the Japanese Imperial General Headquarters to sign the instrument of surrender at the places indicated. Shigemitsu was the first to sign Japan's unconditional surrender. All of us who watch this historic picture would do well to remember that although these signatures have brought peace now, they do not guarantee it forever. The maintenance of peace will demand our utmost vigilance for long years to come. Umeju followed Shigemitsu. Will General Wainwright and General Percival step forward and accompany me while I sign? MacArthur then put his signature to the document using two pens, one of which he handed to General Wainwright thin and haggard from his captivity. The other he presented to General Percival, a prisoner since Singapore. Then, briefly, he rang down the curtain. Let us pray that peace be now restored to the world and that God will preserve it always. These proceedings are closed. This is the story of the return to Singapore and the Japanese unconditional surrender there. Some of the first of the occupation force to land were those famous Indian fighters, the Dogras, comrades of the men who first met the Japs in Malaya at Kota Baru in January 1942. Units of the RAF regiment were also early to land. It must have been a fine sight for the people of Singapore to see British and Empire troops in the streets of the city again after three and a half bitter years of occupation by Japan. For a short time, even now, a few Japanese guards were retained as a purely temporary police force while the first landings were going on. But that didn't last long. The release of our prisoners and internees was obviously a priority duty, and Japanese guards were made to remove barricades at prison camps as well as many other places on the island. As for the prisoners, well, we may have thought there's a cigarette famine here at home, but we haven't known the half of it. Reports of atrocities and ill-treatment followed thick and fast upon the liberation of Singapore. Here among the first authentic pictures is stark evidence of starvation and lack of medical treatment for sickness and disease. All the criminals responsible must be caught and punished. But thank heavens, there is also pictured evidence of another kind. In fact, in the great majority of the films so far received, our prisoners and internees appear to be in good shape, considering everything. The facts of the situation are far from complete, Indeed, many relatives still await news of husbands and sons. Although in this film we see only a few of almost 200,000 captives liberated by SIAC, most of them, here at Changi, for instance, appear to be in better health than was expected. And sooner than expected, Singapore had been reoccupied without the great assault which had been planned. The town was almost intact. Thousands of lives had been saved. And now the Supremo, Admiral Lord Louis Mountbatten, was there in person to receive the surrender from the Japs. He enters the municipal building where the surrender is to be made. And here come the Japanese, General Itagaki and his crew of army and navy officers, who are marched along under strong guard and booed by the crowd. 
This is a picture we've all been waiting to see for a very long time. In they went, or rather were taken, to the appointed place and told where to stand. in his own time, Lord Louis entered and indicated that they could sit down. Here's an extract from what he told them. I have come here today to receive the formal surrender of all the Japanese forces within the Southeast Asia Command. I wish to make this plain. The surrender today is no negotiated surrender. The Japanese are submitting to superior force, now massed here. General Itagaki signed on behalf of Field Marshal Terauchi, who really was ill. Lord Louis had had that checked up. Itagaki had been reported as a fire eater, breathing defiance to the end. But he signed on the dotted line. Lord Louis's signature accepted the Japanese capitulation. More boos and jeers greeted Itagaki and co as they were marched away. Then the Supremo read his order of the day to the parade with thousands of the people of Singapore watching and listening. General Slim, that great British commander, was by his side. I wish you all to know the gratitude and the pride that I feel towards every man and woman in this command today. You beat the Japanese soldier in battle, inflicting six times the number of deaths that he was able to inflict on you, and you chased him out of Burma. The defeat of Japan last month is the first in history. For hundreds of years, the Japanese have been ruled by a small set of militarists, and they have been taught to look on themselves as a superior race of divine origin. They have been encouraged to be arrogant to foreigners and to believe that treachery such as they practice at Pearl Harbor is a virtue so long as it results in a Japanese victory. They are finding it very hard to accept defeat, and they have not been too proud to try and wriggle out of the terms of their surrender. You may well find, therefore, that those Japanese who have a fanatical belief in their divine superiority and who feel that we are too soft to put them in their place will try and behave arrogantly. You are to stand no nonsense from these people. You will have my support in taking the firmest measures against any attempt at obstinacy, impotence, or non-cooperation. The ceremony wasn't yet complete. The Union Jack had still to be hoisted. This was the flag about which Lord Louis had already said. In 1942, the Japanese ordered that the Union Jack and a white flag should be carried through the streets of Singapore. In reply, a British officer explained that no Union Jack was available as all had been burnt. The Japanese accepted this explanation. The officer concerned retained this Union Jack in Changi, where it was used for funerals. It has been handed back to me for hoisting ceremoniously on this historic occasion. After the Supremo had called for three cheers for the king, he drove through vast Singapore crowds, Chinese, Malays, Indians and the rest, and I think we can all judge for ourselves as to the population's reaction to the return of peace, justice and freedom to the city and the island of Singapore, to Malaya and to all Southeast Asia. <laughs> 